What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the Codec First of the Year for 2023. I'm your host, Daly, joined today by David Hayter. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. And co-host with me, as usual, Corrupt Ronan Alex. How you doing, sir? I am fantastic. It's been uh it's been quite some time. Been over it. It hasn't really been over a year since we've done the last interview. It, ha- uh, it hasn't been quite a year since, but um, it's been it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, I think that was uh, I, we talked a little bit off camera about us getting old. I believe that was going to be a dad <laughs> joke for me since the other year just started. I had, hadn't talked to you all year. Yeah. You, know, you know how that goes. Yeah, yeah, you have a habit with dad jokes. So, yes, I'm, I'm quite aware. I'm quite aware. Thank you. <laughs> I, I got to be. It only gets worse with time. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, David, it's been uh, quite a while since we spoke to you. Um, you've had uh, quite a uh, an interesting run the, the last couple of years, some interesting projects, some, uh, uh, you know, one thing I, I do, I want to talk about, I'll mention it here, is you, you have a pretty funny Twitter. You, 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 you get, you get... <laughs> You tweet out some some pretty uh, some pretty funny things and some oh, some well, relevant jokes. Um, that's that's my goal. I mean, that's I that's part of how I built up a big following. I used to do like just a joke a day and and you know something to brighten up people's lives. And uh, unfortunately, lately it's gotten a little overwhelmed with uh, trying to save my show, Warrior Nun. You know, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. yeah well, I, that's something I definitely want to want to talk about. Um, I think um, you know, we've had you on the show a couple of times. We've talked extensively about Metal Gear and Star Wars and other things, and we'll get into that. We have some some questions, I'm sure. But I think maybe uh, Warrior Nun's a good kickoff. Let's uh, let's talk about what's what's going yeah. on with with the show. Tell us a little bit about what it is, um, kind of how it came to be, and then what's going on with it currently. Yeah, so uh, Warrior Nun is a Netflix show, and I was brought in um, in the first season as a writing producer, and show came out. Uh, we shot the first season in Malaga, Spain, in the seaside town in Spain. I didn't, I didn't get to go on the first season, um, but the uh, show was very well received, and we built up this fan base, and then we did season two. And mm. um, at that point, I was an executive producer on the show, I did get to go to Madrid and shoot the second season. I got to live in Madrid. And, oh, wow. You know, Netflix paid for this beautiful apartment. Oh, man. It was pretty damn sweet yeah. and uh, amazing cast and crew. And we just had so much fun. Did the show. The second season came up. It was, we had a Rotten Tomatoes of 100, uh, audience score of 99, nice. <laughs> which made it the best reviewed show in Netflix history, the yeah. best reviewed season of television in Netflix history. Yeah. Uh, so of course then they uh, canceled it. So, <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. So they canceled the show and then the fans freaked out and, um, they have tweeted over 9 million tweets so far. We, we have been outpacing the last of us with warrior nun tweets wow um that's almost, crazy yeah almost entirely since the show came out since last of us came out um and uh and our fans put up a billboard paid for a billboard oh, yeah. for four weeks to sit outside netflix headquarters it's there <laughs> it's there right now uh it faces all the executive offices and then they paid for another one uh just off of times square so the you know the response. Wow! wow. <laughs> yeah, that's not cheap. That's, really, that's not that's cheap. No, <laughs> no. I think it's like sixty-five grand or something. Yeah. Like it was. It was a serious thing. And but you know, fans from all over the world have been rallying for the show, and we'll see if that moves Netflix or if we, you know, we can set it up elsewhere or continue the story in some way because we really, you know, it's very much a labor of love, and 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 I would really love for the fans' sake to to be able to. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, you know, do more with that story, but we'll see. How, how does something like that happen when you have such a good critical response and you mm-hmm. have all this fan stuff? I mean, you've been in the business for a long time. Surely, you you have some kind of insight on why why because we see that with a lot of different shows. Yeah. A lot of really good shows are canceled after a season, and then every blue moon we get a revival like 20 years later or something like right. that so. right yeah I, I you know i'm not i don't really know i mean it felt like the show did really good numbers uh obviously the the audience response was huge but it's a very strange time in in streaming right now okay. um 
you know, when we started the show, like when we started season one, it was still the era when Netflix was buying everything and everybody <laughs> was, there were limitless budgets yeah. and everybody was making shows and, and that was great. And literally there, they lost subscribers the, for the first time, like three months into our writer's room on season one. Okay. And after that, Netflix really changed and started to panic about how much money they were spending. And mm. It's all your password it sharers. <laughs> it's all your password sharers. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Wow. No, I think it's just saturation. I think they yeah. just reached, you know, uh, you know, there's only so many people you can get to subscribe. Anyway, it's just it's a very uncertain market. You never know if they say, "Oh, we've got too many action fantasy shows," or "We've got too many shows about kick-ass tactical nuns," which is probably <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, but out of all the tactical nun shows, we were definitely the best. Yeah, they, you know, you. you, you, you we were the pinnacle of that genre. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I, I don't have the inside information. I mean, very few people get the inside information. Sure. As to yeah, why yeah. Those decisions get made. It, it could be that you didn't make a Korean dub show. Cause that, that seems to be <laughs> the only thing they're the next putting squid out. Game. Lately. Squid yeah. games. Yeah. Uh, me, me and my, uh, my girlfriend have been watching a bunch of them. We've watched one called physical 100. I watched, which, I watched oh, the beginning I've of heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you, I like, the the Korean dub. Normally, I'm not a dub guy because uh, mm -hmm. the they're those voice actors, bless their heart, they're, they're no. nowhere near the quality. You got to you got to start a war. Like we're start a war. here today. You got to start a war with that one. <laughs> because you're asking for it. You got to start a war with okay. that one. But but the the way that these the the Koreans um, film their shows drags everything out so far. So uh, David, I don't know if you finished the uh, the physical 100, but in yeah. like an American TV show. That show would be thirty minutes. Mm. In right. I guess the the way that the, they shoot it, it's an hour long, and there's a lot of like repeating of like the previous segment when they're transitioning to things like that. So right, right. Um, as a director, um, you know, when you see different shows and things like that, do you ever uh, think about how to like implement stuff like that into shows that you write and things that you do? Yeah, I'm I'm pitching a show right now. Um... And I just sold another show. Uh, well, I mean, we're negotiating a deal on another show that I created um, that hopefully I'll announce soon. Okay. And when I'm pitching, one of the things that I, I make clear in terms of my producing philosophy hmm. is that I can't, I can no longer stand 10 hours of television that is really just a two hour movie stretch <laughs> yeah out. i get that i get that you know okay. and it's like because you get a lot of feature screenwriters like me who come in and they're like well i'll just do it like a movie i'll just do it longer hmm. but the problem with that is on page 72 of a movie all is lost everything's <laughs> just bleak and yeah. that lasts like three <laughs> episodes in a in a 10-hour show yeah. Um, yeah and so what i think people forget because television is so serialized is like to, you know, look at Breaking Bad. So Breaking Bad was highly serialized in an era when that didn't really happen. Right. Right. And the storylines would go on and on for for years. But every single episode of that show has a beginning and a middle and an end. It yeah. has a contained story that's told within that comes to a satisfying conclusion right. every single episode while all those ongoing storylines are going on. So when we did um warrior nun season two i was like okay first of all all killer no filler um <laughs> and second every episode has its own theme its own feel the storylines right. will continue but you will have action in the beginning you'll have major action at the end mm. and and so i i'm just sort of hoping we go back to that because we get a lot of boring episodes of television in otherwise decent shows yeah. and, and uh that kind of drives me up a wall. So uh, fair enough. Definitely get well, that. That's part of my philosophy. I, I like that. I like that insight. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Uh, Ronan, you want to take the next question, sir? Yeah. So you said that you kind of, you know, you came in around like season two and stuff like that, but how, like when it comes to, oh, I, got, I was around from season one. I just got, I got promoted. Oh, okay. Um, in so, season two. So how, like, that was awesome. <laughs> so, so how's that like what, what is that process? Like when it comes to bringing on writers or, you know, getting like promoting writers into different, uh, I guess, you know, stages of a, a TV show like that. Like, how did that work out for you, basically? 
Well, the the showrunner is Simon Barry, who's created like five shows and, you know, extremely talented guy. I mean, like, you know, epic showrunner. And it's really up to him to decide how to move the pieces around. So, you know, you, you know, you have a group in season one. Yeah. And then he says, OK, so, you know, for example, you know, David's really good with action or he's mm. really good with. Well, I'm really good with everything, but I'm really good with that. <laughs> Um, and so he says, you know, I'll, I'll have David focus on that aspect or mm. somebody else is really good with romance or, or characters or whatever. I, again, I'm very good at all of those, but, um, but, you know, he's so good at deciding what, what each writer brings to it, you know, mm. what, what their, what their individual voice will be. And you, you know, you, you sort of mix and match people and you promote people or you, you know, let people go or whatever to create the perfect combination of voices mm. for what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty cool. Cause I, I always wonder what the process is like when having, you know, a team of writers working on a TV show or let's say a movie, for example, and how you kind of bounce those ideas off of each other without, I'm, sh I'm sure there are times where you may, you know, disagree about something at some point during the making of this, but like, how yeah, does that, totally. yeah. But how does like, I was curious about how that process works where you guys kind of come together and the thing just kind of takes shape into what it is when we see the final result on the screen. Hold basically. on one second guys. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's cool to, to hear how that, that whole thing kind of comes together and uh, you know, your time with the, uh, with the TV show as well. And, it, it is really unfortunate to hear that Netflix canceled the whole thing, though, considering how well it was doing for the most part. But uh, yeah, I kind of, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the, the the jokes you posted on Twitter as well. <laughs> I right. understand. I saw one of your tweets of you playing Elden Ring, for example. I had somebody ask me about this tweet the other day. Yeah. <laughs> so what? What? Okay. <laughs> out, out, out of my own curiosity, what has been your experience with that game so far? Uh, so I played Elden Ring, uh -huh. and if any anyone who's played it knows that it's extremely difficult. Yeah. But first of all, I, I want to come back to your question about the writers' room because oh yeah, sure, it's By all means, really yeah. fun. When, yeah, you know, after this, but so yeah, Elden Ring. Uh, I started playing. I love I love uh, RPGs and and um, I love medieval games, all those stuff. So I was very very excited. Yeah. And then of course the game mechanics are so difficult, <laughs> and you're and so brutal, like so unfairly brutal where it, you know, you get killed a hundred times yep. trying to kill one particular entity or boss. And then the next guy is, if anything, is harder with a whole different set of things you have to do. <laughs> and yeah. I got, I got almost all the way through the game. I got past like the fire giant and, and like I was really coming up on the end and yeah. I was so annoyed with I, I can't even remember which character it was, but I was just trying to <laughs> hey, kill this character i'm sorry to interrupt ronan can you run the show a minute i had a kitchen fire um, oh, I, will be, I, I will be right back that's all right what yeah, the yeah was. go take yeah go take care of that yeah. while you still can thank you yeah <laughs> yeah that's, that's important yeah um jeez so, well, I hope he's all right. uh, yeah. so um so i was playing it and then so the tweet was uh you know, I was I had been playing Elden Ring for a few months, uh, or you know, months and months, and when I finally realized, hey, I don't work for you. Um, and then a buddy of mine called and said, What does that mean? And I was like, I kind of felt like, you know, a game is supposed to entertain you, it's supposed to be there to to offer you a world where you yep. can go in and kick ass or whatever. And I was like, This game feels like it just enjoys abusing me. <laughs> And that it's my responsibility to impress the game. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, like I have to secretly figure out the, the 4,000 button combination <laughs> in the, in the exact timing that they need it yep. to, to achieve. And, you know, I'm not against a hard game, but it really felt like the game was just <laughs> spinning in my face. And yeah. Like, screw you. You'll never be good enough. And I was like, well, I'm not, if, the, if, if I was playing a card game with my friend and they were like this, I'd, I'd smack them. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I, I, I kind of rage quit. I didn't even rage quit. I was just sort of over it. And I yeah. was like, you know, plus I didn't think the writing was very good. They said it's from George R. R. Martin. And I'm like, yeah. I, I don't think he wrote any of this. Yeah. Like a you lot know? of that, a lot of that stuff is, 
I think like from from what I my understand, a lot of it's kind of like the flavor text and let's say items, for example. I think he might have done right. a, lot, a lot of the work on that, but for the most part, yeah, you can't really. It didn't really seem like he touched a lot of that stuff at the end of the day. I just say, as a writer, I think you could you could turn the game to French or Farsi or Italian, some language you didn't speak, and yeah. it wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. There's like there's not a single thing that anybody says that really makes a difference to yeah. the story so um yeah that, that it really annoyed me after a while <laughs> yeah it, just, it feels know. like it just felt like there was hostility in the code yes there you, you go know? there you go that's it like it feels like the game is actively working against you in a lot of cases i still yeah. enjoyed it like it's one of my favorite games of 2022 but don't tell the internet i said that but <laughs> I, and I understand that the, the, the world is massive yeah. the, the creatures are amazing the you know the the powers, the weapons, you know, all the things you can do, the magic, you know, all of that is amazing. But yeah. I really, but philosophically, I was like, you know, like I went, I started playing uh, Batman Arkham Knight again. Hey, nice. And it's like, you can set that as hard as you want and you'll still, and it'll be hard, but you'll still beat it. Like yeah. you're Batman, you know, you, you make it through. The, in Elden Ring, I just felt like a pathetic loser. <laughs> so... Maybe that's me. No, that's that's, that's that. To, I totally understand where you're coming from. Those games are designed to punish you in in many ways. So getting frustrated with that, I I'm not mad at that at all. I totally yeah, understand my, that. That's my rant. Yeah, totally understand that. But uh, I know you wanted to go back to the uh, the writer stuff for the for the uh, for Warrior Nut as well and talk a little bit more. Oh about yeah, that. well yeah. how it works. And yeah. you're saying you know you know there's disagreements or whatever, and there are. <laughs> but um, first of all, the key to it is there's always somebody in the room that has final say. Yeah. You know, you always have to have, it has to be understood in advance that somebody is going to make the final decision and everybody has to be good with that. Right. And once everybody makes that agreement and, you know, and uh, assuming they trust the person making the final say, mm. everybody puts out ideas and you say, well, how about this? How about this? How about this? And then the final arbiter says, um, I like this idea, but I don't think it fits with everything we've set up beforehand. Mm. Maybe it's more like this or whatever. Um, and with our group, our writers on Warrior Nun, everybody was just, you know, nobody got too possessive over this idea or that idea or whatever. Mm. It was really, really fun and very supportive to, um, uh, you know, we were all just there supporting the story and yeah. putting as much of our love into the characters and the story as, as possible. And then, you know, either I or, or Simon Barry, depending on who was in the room, would say, Oh, I like this direction. Let's let's do that. And then yeah. people would start riffing on that and say, Oh wow, how what if she did this? Or what if, you know, what if she used her powers like this? And then, you know, you're like, Yeah, that's great. And it's really it was really fun. Now I know a lot of writers' rooms can go horribly wrong and everybody yeah. hates oh, each yeah. other. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but we were fortunate that 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 didn't occur on, on Warrior Nun, and it was just really a positive experience. Yeah, I, th I think that shows in the final result of, you know, the what we got I at the end I think so, of too. Yeah. I think so, too. When everybody everybody's voice is heard, like, every episode should feel a little different, should feel like mm. like that individual writer's voice has been heard. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's a group ensemble cast, and it's a group ensemble writing room, and and... Our love, our various voices, I think, come through pretty, pretty clearly. We, we all definitely love that show. Yeah, for sure. So. Welcome back, Daily. <laughs> every, How's your every, kitchen? <laughs> everybody's safe. Okay. Um, my, uh, I cooked dinner for my family before the interview started, and they were out. And I left everything out for them. And I, some, I something happened with the knob on the on my stove. It, it when you turn it, it's supposed to click into place. That's off. It's like a glass top stove. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently, it never clicked into place. So it was just on for the last. Oh, oh man. God, however long. And my, that was my girlfriend who was yelling when when she came in to make sure I was okay. Oof. I went out to check. Yeah, the house was filled filled with smoke. Luckily, I'm, oh, no. I'm good. I'm good back here. Interview can continue. <laughs> yeah, as long as you didn't fine. burn your snake. Yeah, yeah right? the, most, <laughs> the most important item, right? <laughs> yeah, everything's good. It was just a, just a lot of smoke. Um, so I guess we're ordering out today. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, it's crazy. Okay. Anyway, I, I'm sorry I missed that. It sounded like a, an interesting uh, an interesting piece there. Um, yeah. I I wanted to talk a little bit about a role, and we touched on this um, character that you did, David. Uh, I think of the second interview that we ever did with you, and. Every 
I guess, year since then, it seems to be a reprisal role for you. And that is the Star Wars, the Old Republic hmm. game, a, a living, breathing kind of uh, ongoing uh, just character arc for the um, Jedi male uh, just constantly gets updates. This game has been going strong. A, lo- a lot of people didn't think it would make it out of its first couple of years. Yeah. MMORPGs mm-hmm. are notorious for starting up and then, you know, failing or dying. What has it been like to do a role like this? That is like every single expansion, every single thing they have, you know, new, new stuff for you. Mm. Well, it's amazing. I mean, like I wasn't supposed to get the job. The job had gone to somebody else, and then they had to. <laughs> Did it really? Well, it was originally somebody else. I I don't know who it was, but they had to recast for for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, and then they said to Jennifer Hale, you know, we need a new Jedi. Uh, you know, oh, she, Jedi she's character. always got your back, man. <laughs> always, and she's she's like, how about David Hayter? And they were like, do you think he'd do it? And I was like would I play a Jedi <laughs> in Star Wars? <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, so I said, yeah. so I said, yes, I was so excited to do it. And it's, we've been doing it now 15 years. Yeah. So it's been a long yeah, time. It's been a while. And that's three years longer than I played snake. So yeah. it's, um, it's been amazing. And, you know, every now and again, and I've been all over the world and because they're Star Wars, they just find a booth for me. Like I, right. I did, I did one session in Madrid. I did one in Toronto. I did, you oh. know, wherever I am in the world, they just find a booth because they're Star Wars, and off I go. Yeah. So, uh, so it's been it's been so cool, and you know, and he's just a he's just a Jedi. He's you know he's mostly pretty Zen, but of course it's right. Bioware, so you have a whole option where he can right. be totally dick and and uh that's pretty fun too yeah. and 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 there's all these romantic side plots that you know if you want you can have a romance with this character that character i mean really anybody uh, not yeah. anybody but but he's pretty catch as catch can and and uh so i get to be like romantic and flirty and it's it's a blast that job yeah so. that's that's exactly uh one, one of the points i wanted to touch on is because it's a bioware game as you mentioned it's got so many different branching paths with mm-hmm. audio and things like that w- when you compare this this role um just in general over the last 15 years as you said to something like um like maybe snake who's pre-written and there's not a whole lot of wiggle room uh, according to to you guys what's it like when you have all of these different voice options as far as like the recording sessions go. So I'm assuming when you go in for snake, you got your script and it's pretty, you know, mm-hmm. cut and dry. This is what you're doing. This is the scene. When you go to do like a Bioware game, is it any different than, than that? Is it longer? Totally, it's just totally different. Dial- okay. No, it's totally different. That? Yeah. It's not longer because nobody talks longer than snake. Um, <laughs> uh, with metal gear, I always insisted before we started recording, but when we were making the deal, I was like, I want all of the actors in the room with me. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So we have a booth with like, you know, four or five microphones and then the best voice actors in the world come in and we do scenes and I, you know, I do that for a few months uh, and we make a metal gear game on, on Bioware. Uh, and yeah, as you say, we're not allowed to change anything in, in the script, mm. you know, not a, not a word in metal gear. But we do it in order, and we do those scenes like we're acting them out as we go. Oh, okay. Bioware is not like that. Bioware, they give you lines. They tell you what the line before was. They tell you the attitude of the line, like, you know, he's curious or he's angry or he's being, you know, threatening or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you just do these random responses, and you have to make it sound like you're in the middle of a conversation. Yeah. Uh, but it's a very different, it's a very different, um, approach. Yeah. Uh, but again, can't change a syllable on that one because on Metal Gear, it's because they don't want to change the writing on Bi- in Bioware. It's because the computer is already programmed for the, the syllables for the, you know, I don't know, the mouth flaps or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what okay. the technology is, but, <laughs> but I have to hit every single word, you know, even if there's like a weird that in the middle of but, you know, I have to figure huh. out a way to that, make it sound uh, believable. Wow. That's, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. That's cool. I didn't, I didn't cool. know that. That is cool. cool. So, yeah. And with all the different types of responses, like you mentioned, you have, uh, um, you know, c- kind of the ability to shape your Jedi, whether you want to kind of go more towards the light or towards the dark yeah. is um, 
is the progression of this story like interesting to you? Are you kind of catching like bits and pieces? Obviously, I'm uh, I'm assuming you don't have time to sit there and play the entire game, but <laughs> over 15 years, yeah. it, does does this character is he starting to kind of feel like his own character? Because when the game originally started, it was more kind of like a blank slate for the player, hmm. and then now like the more that I look into this game, the more I play, I, I uh, resubbed. Uh, the game here just for for the interview so I could hear some some of the new dialogue from mm-hmm. the Legacy of the Sith DLC came out last year. Um, it, it almost kind of seems like this character is kind of starting to take his own his own shape and and really be a vessel for the character, but also his own kind of like voice in 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 the game. Yeah, I I, I think it's a combination of of those things. I think to a certain extent we want it to be a bit of a blank slate, is because. Like it's not like Snake, where you you can see what he looks like behind yeah, you. Right. You know, in 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 the game, he can be. You know, that my Jedi character could be any race, any. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could be a man or a woman. You know, uh, he can be. Um, you know, an alien, tall, short, whatever. Yeah. So it's sort of like it's meant to be customizable to to whatever the player wants it to be. Now. Uh, the evolving personality is sort of whatever my personality brings to it. Mm. And I kind of, I love the snarky responses because I, <laughs> I get can to tell. Be, <laughs> right. Right. Cause I, cause that's who I am. Yeah. And, and I get to be a little more Han Solo, you know, the pause, the, the purely good sure. responses are a little, I mean, not, not boring, but it, but it's, you know, it's predictable Jedi. And, right. You know, may the force be with you like that sort of thing. And, and, um, and that's cool too, but but when I get to really snark or threaten people or whatever, I really get into that, and you, yeah. you kind of feel who who I am coming through, uh, and so that does give him ideally it gives him some personality. But but at the same time, you know, I feel like the goal is really to make it feel like an individual experience for everybody who plays it. They make they make him who they want it to be. Yeah, and um, it's sort of like uh, uh, Saints Row Four where. You know, mm. you make your guy look like whatever you want. Yeah, right. Nolan exactly. North. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, you know, you get Nolan's personality coming through loud and clear. And yeah, uh, I think, like you mentioned, the the performance, um, you know, pr- provides a lot um, for the for the player to kind of choose. But there's also been a lot of like action and uh, cinematic things going on mm. with the character. And, and one of the lines, uh, you said it as uh, our closer for one of our interviews was, um, you're a threat to everyone in the galaxy. Like just the way you kind of deliver the the Star Wars knowledge and Star Wars lore through the, the vocalization of that, I think it's really paid off for the character. So thank oh, you thank for you. for answering that. Roman, yeah. you wanna grab the next one, buddy? Uh, absolutely. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Bloodstained and your work in that game as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a uh, that was a game. So fun. <laughs> that was a game that started off as a a major Kickstarter uh, when they first it announced did, it. Yeah, yeah. And then it crushed it. It exploded. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. And you know they uh you know one of the goals and stuff like that was getting you on as one of the the side characters in the game that I actually really enjoyed when I played it for sure. But I was oh, kind of curious about uh, like the, when it comes to stuff like that and there's not much I guess you could say there's not much to go on in terms of let's say the the creative part of the process when they're still in the process of making the game like how do they sort of pitch characters like that to you when there's not that much to go on at that point in time except for what they what they basically tell you that that they plan on doing with the character at the time versus what actually ends up being the end product i guess well um yeah they didn't they didn't give me too i mean they said he was a demon hunter and they showed me what he would look like Mm -hmm. uh and then i read the dialogue so those are the three things that um that tell me you know, basically what we're after. And yeah. I try to make it not sound too much like snake. I mean, that's the <laughs> problem with having a, a, a recognizably iconic voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think he was like, and so it falls to me, you know, like he's just like this yeah. calm, vicious uh, killing machine. And um, as you know, but that's the job. You just, you get your script and you, you, you know, sometimes you have nothing to go on and you yeah. just, make a choice and you and you dive in i also do the opening narration yeah you're the you're narrator as well that's yeah. right that's so right. they asked me to do that and i was like it's like maybe i'll do a little ian mckellen you know? <laughs> <laughs> the demon slayers there you that, go that sort of thing so yeah. uh and that again that just kind of you know i wanted to separate my voice my zangetsu voice from the narrator voice and yeah i thought that might be an interesting way to go and 
Uh, but yeah, it's really, cool. yeah. really fun, and I'm glad people enjoy the game. Oh yeah, that's definitely like uh, this. It, it it blew up in the Kickstarter, but it also really took off when the game released as well. I, I thought it was a. I, I'm problem. so glad they were yeah. really nice people. Yeah. Um, it says we have less. happens all the time <laughs> back at it so um you guys were talking about uh, uh bloodstained yes yeah just uh just talking about the uh the process of you know the the character when you don't have much to go on versus a character that's well established on top of that as well and you know the process of, of trying to find out a voice for that character and then uh you doing the narrator as well for the uh for the game and the kind of voice you put on for that which i thought was fantastic obviously you said it, you know you have a very recognizable voice so it was easy for people to pick up on that of course but right. i still think you did a fantastic job in that game overall thank you yeah. well funny funny thing about that is when we started uh doing Star Wars The Old Republic, they're like, look, we want this to be, you know, it's like a Christopher Reeve type of, you know, he's an honorable guy. Mm, and, right. and and so that it doesn't sound like Snake. We want, you know, there's no gravel in the voice. So yeah. it was very much like, you know, may the force be with you uh, always, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I've been doing it 15 years and my yeah. voice has just gotten more and more gravelly. <laughs> I, I sound more and more like Snake in my real life. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. As, as time goes on. So you can hear the gravel creeping into the uh, the Jedi as it goes. Right. And if you look at the clips from 15 years ago, he's kind of a different guy. Yeah. For sure. I think um, it's funny you mentioned about how you kind of tried to downplay the, the snake voice and some of the other roles because there was a role that you did um, a couple of years ago. I, I missed it in the um, interviews that we previously did, and that is uh, you voiced a dwarf in uh, Dragon Age Inquisition. Oh, yes. And yeah. I, I recently played that game, I think sometime last year, just as to, you know, refresh. There's a new one, a uh, new Dragon Age coming out. Um, and I got to that part and I said, hold on, hold on a second. I said, that's David Hayden. I, <laughs> I, I recognize that voice anywhere. And then I started to kind of look into it and I couldn't really find what character it was. What was it like playing, uh, getting to play, a, you know, a dwarf with, uh, you know, this kind of badass kind of attitude, uh, uh, you know, alongside a, a, an incredibly popular, uh, you know, other Bioware game. Well, let me tell you a story about that. So I played Lieutenant Ren in Dragon Age Inquisition. And he was, like you say, he was a badass dwarf. Um, and they showed me the character, but they had brought me in to test out their new performance capture thing. So okay. they put the oh. dots all over my face. Yeah. Oh, nice. On a, 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 a helmet thing camera that was that was on my face so they could record my my um, expressions and they told me it was just to test the the <laughs> technology like that i wouldn't you know this wasn't actually going to be in the game yeah so i just did the snake voice because it's easy <laughs> to do <laughs> and you know and it's emotional yeah, right. and, you know he, he makes all these faces and i thought that'll really sort of test the thing and then they put it in the game <laughs> And, wow, you know, and I was like, I was really annoyed because I was like, I'd have done a different voice, you know. <laughs> I'd have like, given him a Scottish tang, you yeah. know, something, you know, some whole different feel to him, you know. And, I like uh, it. Yeah, uh, and I was like, oh, I was so mad about that. I, you know, it's like <laughs> people are gonna. I mean, people like it, and they come up to me and they yeah. say, "Oh my god, I love that you were in Dragon Age or whatever." Yeah. But I'm like, you know, it makes it sound like I only knew, I can only do yeah. one voice. And... <laughs> That's so a it really was. It, it really yeah. was, and I, I, I was like, and I, I shouldn't have done it. I mean, I should have just on my own never let them record me doing Snake <laughs> without it being Snake. Yeah, sure. Um, but but that's what happened. They just they just told me this won't be in the game. Don't worry, just do anything. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So wow. I could have been like, hey, I'm Lieutenant Red. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I asked about that. That's an interesting yeah, story. I can't, I no can't believe that, 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 that happened. I wow. can't believe it either. <laughs> and they're like, you did it's a really a, good job. And I'm like, it's no, a, I didn't. It's, it's a I complete didn't. performance. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I, you know, hopefully, but yeah, well, there you go. Well, could have gone a different way. <laughs> sounds like a missed opportunity for sure. Yeah, right. That's what yeah. I'm saying. I would love the the Scottish sound. Sounds fun. Hundred uh, percent yeah. to do, to do for him. Um, but to ta to tail end on that, another um kind of smaller indie title that I wanted to talk about uh, before we move move into uh, some of the bigger stuff is um the let, can we get an update on the long dark? 
So you you voice this game with a bunch of awesome Canadian voice actors. Games made in Canada about Canada by Canadians. Awesome premise, very unique art style. It's got a lot going for it. Mm-hmm. They've kind of like 180'd and changed so much about that game since mm-hmm. the last time we, yeah. we talked about that. It originally just had like one or two small sections of the story. Now it's got like an episodic like chapter. New ones are coming out. They just recently released a, a big update for it. Are you still working on that project or is it complete? And if it is complete, um, what was your kind of thought on, on the project as a whole? I can't say for sure, but I think my character, he's moved on from my character. Like, okay. the, So the lead character is played by Mark Meir, who's right. Captain Shepard, Mass Effect. Awesome voice actor, good friend. Um, and at one point, he finds a cabin with me in it, and I'm mm-hmm. a injured trapper um, who's a little Scottish. Yeah. Uh, and he, I thought you were going to shoot me. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> that's, I mean, what so, that's what the, that's, the vibe I was getting when when I encountered you. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're in the middle of a post-apocalyptic winter wonderland, you got to wonder about everybody. So <laughs> that's true. Uh, I mean, that's true. That's true. And he was a big, you know, he's a big tough guy. Uh, but I think you know, it's a it's an epic journey through this snowy wasteland, mm-hmm. and and um, and like you say, it's episodic, goes story to story. I I think it's just a spectacularly beautiful game, and a very cool experience, uh, a very cool world to step into. Um, and I'd love for my character to come back, but, uh, but I'm not sure what they have planned for. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's, I was, I was curious if like your recording was completed for it, that kind of thing. So yeah. um, as far as I know, but I'd come back in a second. I, I love those guys. Raphael von Lirop, who created the game is amazing. Jennifer Hale's in it, like every every great Canadian yeah. voice actor. That's what I said. I said they, they really hit hit the all star cast. Yeah, I was gonna say that. that one. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, like it is. It's you know, and it takes pride in the fact that it is a full on badass Canadian. Yeah, game, yeah, you know. As, as it should, as it should. They they've done a, a really good job, and I've seen a lot of. Um, good things from canadian developers here recently oh yeah um, sure doing doing a lot of good stuff games specifically about canada which is always fun to learn about yeah um ronan you want to grab grab the next one yeah so i know you kind of uh, talked a little bit about like let's say for example dragon age and the uh the full like facial capture stuff that they had you do for that game i was kind of curious about because obviously you've been in the voice acting game for a while now versus you know way back in 98 for example with metal gear solid versus now like i'm curious about <laughs> like Lord. What like what were the challenges for you having to adjust to the changes in technology for voice acting and full performance capture in games back then, or right. like well, the way it worked back then, as opposed to where it is now? Yeah, from the the house with the garbage truck driving in front <laughs> <Yeah>. of it. <laughs> right. Well, just to give you some perspective, first video game voices I did were in 1985. Oh wow! So I was in high school. And I lived in Japan, and we were asked, uh, Japanese game developers came to my school because they wanted four guys that could speak English to do video game voices. Yeah. So that was the first. I've been doing voices in video games since voices existed in wow. video games. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, I've seen all the changes, you know, home to arcade games, home consoles, all those things. I, I don't know if it's going to be a very satisfying answer, but oh, acting nice. is acting. Yeah. You know, I feel like you know, whether it's performance, like when I'm doing performance capture with the dots on my face, I forget I'm doing it. I mean, Mm. I just, you know, you have the thing on your head and you got sort of a camera in in front of you, but that's no different from acting in a movie where the camera's like right up in your face and you just have to, you just have to commit to the moment. So I I don't think it's changed that much. Um, Sadly, I never do uh, motion capture. Like my friend Elias Tufexis does that all the time gets to put on the suit and does a motion, yeah. you know, which I'd love because I know how to fight and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm relatively fit person. <laughs> and so I would love to do those things, uh, but I never get asked. So mm. um, also because voiceover is not my primary job. I'm primarily a screenwriter, producer, yeah, right. uh, occasional director. Um, so, you know, I, I don't do it as much as some of my contemporaries, but, uh, but overall, I mean, I, I don't think, doing that performance capture motion capture is any different from having to do that on a movie or okay um or even if you know you were on stage you still have to move the same way you still have to you know yeah perform and commit to your character so 
yeah, the technology changes, but the I, I, the the art of it, I think, remains constant. Yeah, that's that's actually pretty cool because I, I was always curious about how you know that kind of affects or you know maybe impacts the way a vo voice actor approaches that particular role if they're doing full performance capture, if they're wearing the full body suits, or they just have the dots on their face, or both. I've seen a lot of situations where they have the suit on and the facial stuff as well. And sure, I was, totally. that, I was curious about how, if that has any impact on that at all. And for somebody who's been in the game as long as you have, you know, there's any been, has there been any changes to the approaches that you've made when it comes to stuff like that as well? But it's good to hear that, like, the, the idea still remains the same right. no matter what, and the effort still remains the same <laughs> no matter what, so. I think so. I mean, yeah. really, all it's about is transfer you know illustrating emotion mm. and transferring energy and and story beats to people and that you know yeah I don't think that's changed since greek theater you know it's um it's just the weird suits you have to put on to accomplish <laughs> it now. yeah that's true <laughs> all right daily go ahead yeah sure so i i want to jump uh and, and talk a little bit about um uh metal gear okay because metal there, gear I, that's you know we, we got to talk a little bit about it so yeah um and and i just want to have a, a kind of a candid conversation I, some of the the subjects here are, are um gonna not necessarily dicey, sensitive. Emotionally yeah, yeah. Dicey. exactly <laughs> um so uh you know recently with um all the the new talk of um po the new possible metal gear rising shout out to quentin flynn mm. hopefully that that comes to fruition yeah. um and uh the re supposed remakes and remasters. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about your opinion on the the trilogy the trilogy of games um, first, and then we'll talk about the saga in general. But Metal Gear Solid One, uh, Two, and Three. I wanted to ask you your your honest opinion, not just as a voice actor, but as somebody who's you know played the character and for all of these years. What's your thought on them doing a remaster? Which is that something you'd like to see? Because we're at a point now where um, you know, everybody from the cast is is starting to get older. Unfortunately, we've lost um, Mr. Sigan. I hope I pronounced that. Yeah, correctly. John Sigan. Yeah. yeah, incredible who voice played, actor. Who played Solidus. Solidus, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And and that to to me as a fan, I, I would love to see this kind of recaptured and and kind of immortalize as one like final time we get everybody together that did the original voices that we can and and do that kind of thing but i've also heard on the other side of the fence that people would rather the game stay the way they are and mm. maybe them tell different stories with different characters so what what's your opinion as is not just the voice actor behind snake but you know really the guy the, that kind of brought that that franchise to life for a ton of people um uh, well, that's a complex question. I, I, I told you. I, I, to, I, I told you this. Yeah, you were right. Gonna be... You were right. Um, well, look, I, from from a Solid Snake perspective or a Naked Snake perspective, I'd rather that be the central character. Mm. I feel like Snake is obviously a huge draw um, to those worlds. Although, as you say, uh, I, I was recently playing metal gear rising revengeance for the, mm. for the first time and it's mm. badass oh you know, yeah it's got, hell yeah it is it's got quentin being awesome and i i, I didn't miss me at all um <laughs> so i suppose it's possible to do other stories that wouldn't really affect me so i i wouldn't really care um but uh as far as remakes or remasters go my feeling is those games are astounding mm. um to this day uh i you know kojima you know, I might have issues with him here and there, but he's a genius. And sure. Um, and Metal Gear One, you know, Shadow Moses Island, to this day is just the atmosphere of it, the storytelling of it, yeah. the, the tone of it is just completely unique. So, um, and each game is completely unique unto itself. Right. So, yeah. uh, so I, I really feel like anything that opens the games up to a new generation of fans. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, it's good for me because I remain, you know, a popular yeah. guy, but <laughs> but I think it's good for gamers to to know that they're out there. Like, you know, games like that, it's like a great album or a great novel right, or something. True. Like, you know, people say, you know, have you read uh The Great Gatsby or something like that? You know, and it's it's been 80, 90 years, however long it's been. Oh, yeah. And it, still a great book it's still an amazing experience have you right. seen 
you know, movies from the 1970. Have you seen The Godfather? Well, that's still a great <laughs> yeah. movie. It doesn't matter yep. that it came out in 1972 or three or whatever it is. Um, and uh, and I feel the same way about games. You know, part of the problem with games uh, philosophically is they keep coming out with new consoles that don't play the old games. Right, so and I think like, that's one yeah, of the main issues. Just disappear, and that's I think that's really a shame because you know it's really tragic like it's like saying you can only watch movies from 2012 to 2023 yeah now. yeah if you have the, the the ps5 movie player or whatever yeah. yeah you know can you imagine how horrible that would be <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. Um, if, if if the movie came out on tape you can't watch it on you know streaming that, that kind of thing right and yeah. i i think that's part of the 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 question that that i'm that i'm posing to you is like a, a lot of people, especially with Metal Gear, it's an iconic franchise, not right. just in the video game world, but emotionally for a lot of people. You won't believe the. I mean, you probably will because you do a lot of cons and things like that. But people will come and tell you how you know your performance changed their life or helped them through a dark time, yeah. and and you know they they love the character that you brought. To life but as you said it's so it's you know it's incredibly hard to go back and play metal gear solid one um if you don't have the proper equipment i think mm. yeah um you know have to have certain things it's <clears throat> not on the playstation streaming service like it used to be yeah. uh anymore and um there's issues uh copyright issues with metal gear solid 2 right now where it's on unpur- right. it's unpurchasable yeah. you can't buy it if you have it you can still play it but they uh you can't purchase it anymore because there was some uh like uh, footage in the game that the license ran out and Konami has not yeah. you know, renewed the license so they can't sell it. And wow. so when you, when you see things like that happen, you know, I, I want, you know, my, my stepson, I want to show him metal gear one through <laughs> metal gear, you know, five, it's, it's yeah. almost impossible, it's almost to, impossible. To, to, to do that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if, yeah. if that's not right. hy- hypothetically, if, if, if it were to happen, would you like to do a remaster? Let's just pretend they had some kind of way to make it, across platform they 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 do but for money reasons they probably won't but <laughs> assuming they did how would you how would you like that tackled would you like to try and get um the all of the original cast back or do you think a recasting of certain characters i know patrick zimmerman probably isn't in the voice acting game currently i don't know well, we don't know he's, he's difficult to track down pa- patrick is often you know Riding his motorcycle across america exactly and, right you know, i've, I've was, asked I mean, uh hopefully <laughs> First hopefully thing, we to can, get him on. Yeah, hopefully we can track him down. Which she, you know, she's his ex-wife. She can't always track him down either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, pet, Ocelot goes where where the wind blows. <laughs> yeah, so, I've, I've, um, I've tried to contact him myself, and I think I got maybe one or two messages out of him. Yeah, on he replied Twitter. to me too. Yeah, He's like, just, let's let's do an interview. And then yeah, I never, 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 never heard back. Him. Never, yeah, never heard back. It's crazy. Yeah, no, he's his, he's his own man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, the my feeling is any time we can get. The band back together i'm i'm down I, mm. I i love those worlds as you say i i go to a lot of comic cons and and it happens a lot that grown men will burst into tears talking to me yeah. and and a lot of them are surprised that that happened like it just happens <laughs> like oh my god i mean you know yeah. uh, but you know but it's you know but but snake the all the years that you as the player have lived as snake you know mm-hmm. all of the, the months and months of you know doing missions and it's not just that you're watching my character it's that you are my character right. and that voice is in your earphones or whatever being your voice it's in your head so it's a really weird close relationship yeah yeah so you know when they start to cry i'm like i i understand you know it's fine <laughs> yeah um so you know it's, but it's so lovely and i i just you know that um apart from some of the other perks i mean that's that's my favorite part of the right, job yeah. is that people are so moved by what you did or or as you say it's they bonded with their dad or they or they it got them through a tough time, or they were going through PTSD, or or what? You know, I hear a lot of it, and and it's really cool. Yeah. That's like yeah. the whole purpose of of doing this job for me. You know, it's is to make people happy, to inspire them, to you know, make them feel like ultimate badasses, and you know, so yeah, uh, so yeah. I'm, look, I'm down for whatever they want to do, or if it's you know, if it's moved on, then 
you know, I'm, I'm a pretty Zen character. Okay. Fair I'll enough. That's pretty cool. I'll take it whatever way it comes. So my, my last question then, um, on that subject is, um, Am I hearing? Do you guys hear that? I heard a hear? little something, but it's but no, you're. Uh, I'm you're I'm totally hearing uh, I'm hearing another person somewhere. Uh oh. I, I don't know. Fire or... No, no. In my <laughs> in uh, in my headset, I'm I'm hearing uh, I'm oh. hearing another person. I'm not I'm no, not sure uh, that's not sure what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> thanks, David. Yeah. Uh, so I'm hearing my... someone else. No, you're not. My last question then um, on, on this particular topic, and I think um, my co-host here, uh, Ronan, really touched on it when we talked to, to Matthew Waterson hmm. about voicing the Doom guy. Yeah. Some people are going to love your decision to do something and some people are not. Yeah. And sure. specifically with, with John, who we mentioned uh, passed away, his incredible performance with Solid as Snake. Um, what's, your, what's your opinion on how we approach that role similar to like Carrie Fisher when, you know, star Wars or, mm. uh, you know, these different characters that they bring back their likeness and their, their voice through AI. Um, would you like to see something like that? Or would you like to maybe see like, uh, somebody who was a big fan of John, who's a voice actor, tried to do a voice match. What's your kind of take on that situation? I don't think it's ethical to ever use AI to replicate another a living person's or or a passed away person's voice. Okay. I agree. Um, I agree. That's not, you know, first of all, a character needs a soul. And yeah. Sure. Just because you can replicate the the vocal tone is not, that's not an excuse to replace somebody's performance. Mm. Um, I would look at it very similarly to uh, Gray Fox in the original Metal Gear. I uh, was played by Greg Eagles and right. he's amazing. Um, you know, it's one of the iconic performances. I, I don't know why Greg, was not able to do it for the twin snakes yeah um but rob paulson came in and he played yeah. gray fox yeah. in, in the twin snakes and of course rob paulson is a legendary voice actor a, a master of his craft not the same performance right but still but still has a great essence, deal of yeah. impact yeah. and and you know uh, so I, I you know is it right to replace john Sigan? i don't know i i, I feel like it's right to to if you if you have to remaster the character bring in the best voice actor you can uh, but i don't think you copy him i think you just do okay. whatever you feel is yeah. right for the character yeah. and then john's and john's performance you know lives on like it does know, it's look, fantastic yeah it's amazing you can always amazing look it up you can always see the cutscenes. you can always yeah. you know that's the nice yep. thing about, about the internet one one of the few uh nice things about the internet. so <laughs> Um, do, you, do you think it needs to be re, redone for a remaster? I'm not a game That's developer, a question. nor, a, nor a voice actor, yeah. um, but I don't know if it's uncommon. Uh, I mean, I've been interviewing voice actors forever. I should know probably how this works, but it's not something I've ever asked uh, to to use the original recording from, you know, the the uh, Metal Gear Solid Two. Well, uh, so on the first Metal Gear. Um, I mean, I, I told this story and you mentioning the garbage trucks makes me think you might have heard it. Uh, so the first Metal Gear we recorded for the PlayStation 1. Yeah. The Twin Snakes, they wanted to, to, to put the same game out on the Nintendo GameCube. Yeah. Yeah. But the sound card on the GameCube was better than the sound card mm. on the PS1. So suddenly you could hear the traffic going by. <laughs> On the, you know, yeah. you're a motorcycle, because we just recorded in this weird house in Hollywood, the first game. And so you could hear motorcycles pulling up to the, the stop sign out the window, and none of it was usable. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, yeah, the idea that you remaster the game and then remaster the original voice, um, voice talent, uh, is fine. I, I, I'd be fine with that. Um, but you never know if the, if, it's usually, if the yeah. recording is of a quality that will match up to today's technology, sure. basically. Yeah. Or if there's any, you know, and there's always like some sort of post problem or, so, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or if it even exists. Or anymore. if it even exists. That's like, true. You <laughs> even, <laughs> yeah. like you have the original stems and tracks and, right, uh, you yeah, know, right. all the different things. Can you remix them or do you just have the original recording of the game? in this final mix and you can't adjust that for visuals right, or, right. or whatever you know you never know what technical thing is going to get in the way so if they could remaster the original performances from um 
from Snake Eater or what have you, uh, that's fine. I mean, great to sure. do that, but yeah. um, but it may not be possible. Hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And like I said, I know that was you know kind of an uncomfortable you know entire topic or whatever but i, I appreciate it awesome okay. well, i appreciate yeah. you taking it man thank you uh ronan you want to um take one or two more before we wrap up yeah this one actually comes from uh our third co-host who couldn't make it actually and i kind of want to okay. piggyback off of this one a little one a little bit as well because i'm curious about this too but he says i kind of want to get david's thoughts on you know animation movies using big time actors and celebrities instead of voice acting like for example the super mario movie that's coming out with Ooh, chris Pratt. <laughs> so he's like he says i get the business aspect of it but do you do you feel like uh, actors deserve more recognition to be put into these movies and i kind of i kind of want to piggyback off of that as well because let's say for example they made let's say uh, uh they keep talking about doing this all the time but the metal gear live action movie let's say they were to throw away that concept and just go completely cgi like they do for mario for example like how would you feel for example if they decided you know well, we won't we won't recast david as snake for this movie but we'll have somebody else come in and you know fill the shoes as snake i guess well, come in and fill the shoes of Snake to do what? To do the voices, to... the, the voice specifically. Oh, well, that would be outrageous. And blasphemous. <laughs> I, I, I agree. They would, all, yeah. they would all go to hell. Yeah. Um, obviously, I would prefer to do the voice. I think that, you know, the voice is, is so woven into the character that I think if it was animated and they chose a different voice, I think that would be a mistake. Mm. I agree. Um, I agree. I mean, you know, look at look at Metal Gear 5, like, you know. Everybody's like, oh, great game, but that's not really Snake. Yeah. Not everybody. I mean, some people were fine with it. And, right. and most people. Most, yeah. Most. <laughs> but I think there was, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's like when they changed the voice of Bugs Bunny or something, and you're like, no, that's not Bugs Bunny. And, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. That's all. That said, my friend Eric Bowser now does Bugs Bunny, and he's astounding. <laughs> <laughs> so take that as an example. But yeah. Um, I would love to do the animated version of a metal gear movie or whatever i'm i'm certainly down for that yeah what sony wants in an ideal world if i may speak for them and i think i might <laughs> is a 200 million dollar movie with a huge movie star mm. that introduces the world of the game to people who have never played the game before mm. and to do that and to justify that sort of budget you need an oscar isaac you need somebody who yeah. is um you know far more famous than me because there's more movie going people than there are movie going fans of the game. Sure. Right. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I don't like, I think that I can certainly be done don't begrudge me. Oscar Isaac for, for taking the role. I think that's, I think that's amazing that a, a movie star of that caliber would, uh, be interested in doing. It. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And people are like, Oh, they should cast you in the movie. And I'm like, you know, they're not going to cast me. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> well, I mean, they can do that tastefully. We talked about off camera. Last of Us. Uh, Troy Baker famously voices Joel from The Last of Us, and he is, you know, in in the promotional material. Right. He's uh, got a couple of uh, Easter eggs apparently hidden in in throughout the show that kind of references him and and his oh, cool. you know, his work to it. So well, I think you can always you know, do those things. As yeah, well. like, I, like as long as they pay some pay some respect. You right. Know I mean, you, yeah. you brought this character to life. Right. You deserve some something in there. Codec call, uh, you know, cameo <laughs> passing. You know, maybe you're well, the guy like, who I, I, cut yeah. snake's hair. Maybe you could be that guy. <laughs> well, that's strange, but sure. Um, I. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that would be great. Um, Hollywood doesn't necessarily run on respect. True. Uh, that's uh, true per yeah. se. Um, but I think those things are great nods for the fans. And it's yeah. really nice to, you know, for somebody who loves Troy Baker's amazing performance, you know, you get those Easter eggs and that, yeah. Yeah. you know, that that sort of touches your gamer's heart. And and like you say, it's a it's a nod of respect to to an epic performance. So, yeah, um, yeah, I'd love that. But I don't you know, I don't necessarily expect anything. Sure. Like, yeah. like I, I, I literally have made two movies with the CEO of Sony. So like, <laughs> I know these people directly. Yeah. And yeah. very and good. Very good. So whether they bring me in or not, I, I don't know, you know, yeah. Okay. Could happen. Maybe they dislike, maybe Tom Rothman is still mad about something. I said on <laughs> too. You know. Yeah. It's weird when your screenwriter life overlaps with your voiceover actor life. Yeah. So would you like? Would you say it really just comes down to you know just trying to get as many people to come and watch these movies as possible, regardless of you know whether or not they've played these games or or just fans of the series in general? Well, I'll tell you what, Tom Tom Rothman, who was the president of Fox when we made X Men, mm. I said to him because I was a comic book fan, I was like, "Look, there's 50 X Men 
titles. Like, yeah. I mean, this is a huge comic book. So isn't that sort of a guaranteed fan base? And he said, David, the fans of the comic book will be done by 10 p.m. Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to get everyone else. Yeah. Now, video game players, there's more of them than there are comic book sure. buyers. True. But um, I think the same principle applies. Yeah. They have to reach the biggest audience possible to even make a, a movie that's comparable to the games, you mm. know, to make a movie of that size, which will probably be $200 million yeah. at least. Yeah. Um, you need to reach as many people as possible. So I, I, like I said, I don't, I don't begrudge that. I think Oscar Isaac badass, and I hope, I hope we get to see that movie. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, that, yeah, that's all. That's all I got okay. for that big question, but yeah, go ahead. All right. So we'll wrap up. I got a couple of, uh, fan questions. Um, David, you know, roll through these kind of quick, quick fire um question so the first one comes from scene vic he wants to know um what the most difficult mgs game was it for you performance wise uh, metal gear 4 um i had to you know use old snake oh yeah and uh and people you know if anybody thinks i can't do the normal snake it's I'm so I, snake, you know. I hear I, that I, so much. People, Why? people really it's, say it's, that. I, I've never yeah, seen that. Do. Yeah, I, I do. Sound, I sound pretty much the same as I did. But, yeah. um, but old snake, uh, I was like, he has to be falling apart. And he has to be falling apart as the game goes on. Hmm. That it just gets worse and worse. And he can barely communicate. But we did the game out of order. So I had to know oh, wow. what point in the game we were for each scene. To know how desiccated I would fall, I, I would be. Wow! Um, wow! So that was it. Was a much harder voice to do, and it was hard to sort of coordinate that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Please. Um, this one comes from uh, Brodo Twenty One. Uh, he wants to know if you have a favorite scene from any Metal Gear. I uh, I have many favorite scenes. I I cannot pick just one. Uh, uh, the the death of Sniper Wolf, uh, the death of the boss. At the end of Snake Eater is astounding. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, fighting Vulcan Raven, uh, <laughs> Metal Gear Four when Metal Gear, Metal Gear Rex fights Metal Gear Ray, uh, the final fight with Ocelot in Metal Gear Four where all the old themes are coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's, there's, there's too many to you know. Sure. Um, there's too many great scenes for me to pick one. Yeah. All right. Next one comes from Mr. Weeb. He wants to. He just wants to tell you, uh, thank you for giving him an amazing childhood memory, and you're the most badass voice that he's ever heard. And he says you're pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's well, pretty good itself. Mr. Weeb, you're pretty good. Hey. <laughs> All right. Uh, next is from uh, Spider-Man Unknown. He said, uh, and I think we kind of already touched this, but we'll ask it anyway. Um, if you were given a choice, um, would you like to continue the story of Metal Gear in a sequel or a prequel? Uh, it doesn't matter to me as long as the story is good, but I do feel like there's a huge amount of uh, uh, big boss story stories like from the original nes okay so big that, boss like that, specifically hmm. well i just think there's a there's a lot of story that we've referenced there that sure. we haven't seen you know hmm. there's a lot of lore that i, I agree yeah about that's true that i think could be brought to new generations i'd um, love to see that but a sequel you know them going on uh assuming snake assuming solid snake survives after metal gear 4 you know it'd be interesting to see where he's at and uh, again just comes down to the story who's making it and how how well executed it is Awesome. Well, that'll uh, wrap up the fan questions. Thank you for everybody that submitted them. I actually got one more here from our uh, third coast. Okay. Just one yeah, more. <laughs> yeah, no. Sorry, I just, I just noticed it, from, yeah. Uh, from chat. Yeah. I those, just, well, I'm, I'm done with those. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just got one more here from uh, from our coast. He says, uh, he wants to know if you've been interested in doing, uh, I guess, more anime voice acting. As you've had some roles in the past with like Escaflone, Yu Yu Hakusho, and stuff like that. But would you be interested in doing a lot more of that in the future? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I really got my start in, in L.A. doing anime um, with Steve Blum and Brian Cranston. Oh, Steve we Blum, used to, yeah. We used to get paid $50 an hour to do anime voices. Um, the problem is a lot of those, uh, yes, I, the short answer is yes, I would love to do more anime. <laughs> I love anime. I love anime fans. Um, I grew up in Japan, so I, uh, you know, I feel like I've, I've got a real affinity for it. Yeah. Uh, the problem is a lot of those games are non-union, and mm. it's just mm. not. I can't legally do it. Yeah. Um, uh, 
which is a shame because uh you know they're big business they should be union games and um uh or union uh titles and yeah and, sure uh, if they're not it makes it very difficult for me to to do it but uh from the from the purity of my heart yes i would love to do more yeah. anime that's cool awesome yeah I, I would love to see it as well i think Same. um you know that's a it's a it's a fun thing to see you do all these different things uh, like as you mentioned aside from being you know screenwriter director and all that all that kind of stuff i i obviously love to you know, see you do do the performance as a as an actor, wherever it may be, whether it be in you know the the live action, which you've done a couple of live action shorts, I believe, hmm. recently as well. Um, Dollar Generals comes. comes oh, I did. Yeah. Yes, that was a friend. Well, <laughs> well, that was directed by one of our our, our writers on um, Warrior Nun, Brendan Gallagher, okay. and and Claire Downs, his wife, and and so yeah, they just asked me to come in and do a a cameo, which was really fun. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. That's cool. But, yeah, the, but the anime performances, if anybody wants to look up Fushigi Yugi or Moldiver or uh, uh, Lupin Castle of Cagliostro, those, oh, nice. I love those performances. Yeah. And, and um, or Gundam War in the Pocket is yeah. there you go. one of my favorites. Nice. I got to do so many different things. Like I got to be goofy and tragic and you know, all sorts <laughs> of cool stuff. So. So uh, before we wrap up, I'd love to give you a chance. I know um, on Twitter you were just uh, doing a couple of conventions with some of the other Metal Gear mm -hmm. actors. Do you have anything upcoming or anything that you'd like fans to know about? Go check out anything like that. Shameless plug time. Yeah, I'm I, I'm going to be appearing uh, in Chile, in Santiago, Chile, for the first time. Nice. Uh, first Congratulations. time in South America. So I'm doing that August 14th at, at uh, Gamer City Con, uh, 14th through the 16th, which will be amazing. So any of my South American fans, if you can make it to Santiago, I'd love to see you. Awesome. Um, I'm doing Emerald City Comic Con uh, on, on uh, March 4th, I believe um that weekend so i'll be in seattle i i've got a few i'm going to be doing um i, I don't I, I don't know the dates offhand i'm doing orlando and philadelphia and i'm do, doing a couple more than i usually do i usually do about seven i think i'll do about 10 this year sure oh, wow. what we can do is um, after we go offline here maybe uh, later in the week i'll send you a message on um twitter and if you okay. can give me those dates, I'll put them in the in the video description. Yeah. That way, if anybody watches this in the future, Same. they'll be able to kind of see what's up what's up and coming for you. That sounds great. That sounds All right, awesome. we'll do that. So I've got that, and then I've got other projects that I haven't. I'm not able to announce yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we keep an eye on you. You know, we we got to make sure <laughs> we don't go so long without having you on the show again. Yeah. I think it's it's been a couple of years since we had you on, so I definitely appreciate you making the time um, to come back and. Uh, you know, uh, speak with us and all that. And um, I think real quick before we go, we need to do an outro, but it looks like this thing wants me to redo the, the call again. Uh -oh. Okay. So let me uh, disconnect with you guys. I'll send you a link. We'll do our outro. Then we'll get out of here. All right. Sounds good. All right. And bear with me as my kitchen caught on fire today <laughs> and sharing all these amazing stories real quick before we do the outro, before we go, I wanted to, to talk about the uh, X-Men comic that you showed us a little earlier oh, yeah. um can you just tell uh here at the end um kind of how you came about this and uh tell everybody kind of what it is because it's it's an an awesome piece to have yeah it really is thank you so it was recently my birthday and i went i met a friend of mine who was in from out of town and he brought me a present i was like well, that's not necessary and then he showed me <laughs> the present and it's it's x-men issue 133 it's signed by chris claremont who mm. is the greatest x-men comic book writer of all time um these are the comic books i was reading when i was a teenager yeah that that gave me my knowledge the x-men and this particular one has wolverine there's a moment where wolverine goes up to this soldier and he puts his claws up against the guy's thing and two of the claws come out on either side of his neck pinning him yeah. to the wall and then the middle knuckle is there and he goes you want to go for three and I took that moment and I replicated it. Sort of, I didn't do the dialogue, but I had that exact same moment to right. introduce the clause in the first X-Men movie. So it was a very thoughtful gift and it will be going up on the wall in my office here. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, as one of the most inspiring comics that I ever read and also very influential on, on our first two movies. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah, I, awesome. I gotta say, I think that that's a great a great story, and I think it's 
just a, a testament to how you can enjoy a, a piece of media like that yeah. and then end up creating and writing for that, you know, that piece of material. So definitely, um, definitely guys happen. A young, your dreams. say a young person's out there and they played Metal Gear and they were inspired and then they end up working on Metal Gear 7, you know, it's, yeah, it's right? it yeah. can happen. Dreams well, you heard it here. Metal Gear Solid Seven confirmed by by <laughs> David Hayden. That's going to be the the, yeah. the click yeah. clickbait of the video. Yep. That shouldn't that shouldn't cause me any problems at all. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you so much. Um, before we go, we we got to do an intro for the show, and you've done a couple of intros for our show um, mm-hmm. over over the years. We've had you do Snake. We've had you do uh, the Star Wars character. We've had a couple of different versions of Snake. I, I think it's only appropriate. Uh, um, as we talked about earlier, we're me and Rona, we're we're getting a little old here. Can we get you to do old snake as uh, as the intro uh, for the show? Uh, yeah, and you uh, so sure. uh, so you watch, the in- this, you're listening to the codec. Yeah, uh, this is David Hader, and you're listening or watching the codec. All right. This is David Hader, aka Old Snake. And you're watching and listening to the codec. So pay attention. Love it. Yeah, Thank you so awesome. much, sir. That all right? Again, we oh, uh, yeah. appreciate all your time. You have a great rest of your day. And uh, like I said, we'll be in touch on Twitter. We'll get those dates from you. So anybody um, watching this post, make sure you check the description down below of my video and Ronan's video for any upcoming um dates that david has for uh conventions and fan stuff yep. i know you do some streamly sometimes maybe you have one of those coming up uh nothing immediate planned but okay. but uh, at some point we'll we'll do another one with awesome with keep an eye out on those 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 support the the voice actors guys and they're, they're awesome they, yeah. they, they get you the so, some amazing amazing prints and uh everybody that that attends those is, is awesome as well uh again thanks so much and we'll see you guys next time yep. on the codec